Good evening, everyone, and happy Earth Day. Um, so thank you for that really wonderful introduction. And um, yes, I've um, also added my um, website and uh, Twitter handle. So if you'd like to get in contact with me, that has all of the information as well. So I'm really excited to tell you all uh, about many of the multiple interacting factors that are contributing to native bee declines, um, both here in Michigan, as well as um, throughout the United States and global impacts. So um, there's three parts to my talk tonight. So first I'm going to introduce the diversity of native bees. Um, they're really cool and there's just, there's so much in how they look and how they, the ecological roles that they fill, um, the roles in pollination that are really important. Um, so we'll explore a bit of that. And then we'll get into some of the key factors that have been contributing to native bee declines, including habitat loss, pesticide use, climate change, and the current spread of infectious disease. And then um, at the end, we'll end on a positive note of some good news that I can show from my own research, as well as um, some key things that we can do to promote uh, bee diversity. Okay, so I'm gonna ask you all to take a second to picture a bee, just the first bee that comes to mind. And I'll bet that many of you probably pictured a honeybee. Um, this is sort of our, our quintessential bee that most people tend to think of. It lives in a big colony. Um, they are quite ubiquitous across the landscape. Um, we, we see them pollinating a lot of different kinds of flowers and crops. They're, they're really important. Um, some of you may have also pictured a bumblebee, which is actually a native bee. Uh, we have many different bumblebee species throughout the United States. And this one that I'm showing here is called Bombus impatiens. It's actually the Eastern bumblebee. And they're incredibly common in Michigan here and throughout most of the Midwest and Eastern United States. Um, and bumblebees are also generalists. They are very common in many different habitats and they um, like a lot of different kinds of flowers. But we have a ton of diversity of native bees throughout uh, North America. So all of these bees can be found in North America, um, not all quite in Michigan, but um, there's just incredible diversity in how they all look and the roles that they fill. So these can actually be dominant pollinators in many of our plant communities. And we have 450 different bee species just here in Michigan alone, and about 300 and, sorry, 3,600 to 4,000 species throughout North America. And uh, these species range from being a social species like a honeybee where they live in large colonies of um, thousands of bees uh, or bumblebees that live in uh, colonies of, about, of a few hundred uh, to being solitary bees where they only live by themselves. They, um, their entire life cycle is, is on their own. Um, and they vary in size. So like this yellow faced bee is quite small. The carpenter bee there is one of the larger bees that we have in the United States. Um, they're, they're quite large. Um, so there's a hu huge range here. Um, and before I get too far ahead of myself here, I want to quickly define what I mean by native bees. So native bees are bees that are native to a particular area. And so since we're here in the United States, I'm primarily focusing on native bees to uh, North America. Um, but uh, honeybees, I have to note, are actually an introduced species to North America. They are native to Europe and the Middle East and have been distributed around the world um, through trade and because of their use for producing honey and pollinating a lot of different crops. Um, and then just because bee pictures are a lot of fun, uh, these are all some bees that are some of my favorites here in Michigan. So um, you can see the diversity in coloration, their size, um, the sweat bee, that is on my finger for ref size reference. So they're just truly very tiny. Uh, they vary in flower preference, which we'll talk a little bit more about, um, their sociality, as I mentioned, as well as their nesting sites. So there's, there's a lot in terms of 
how they all interact with each other. Um, that is really quite cool. So as I mentioned, they're, they nest in, in really different kinds of habitats. So um, oftentimes people think of, of bees nesting in these the large kind of apiaries, the honeybee colonies. Um, and that's not true for most native bees. So um, on the left, you'll see a, um, this is a, a bee hotel. And you can see a number of different stems as well as holes in wood. And a lot of bees love to, to nest in those types of habitats. So here on the top left, you can see what it looks like inside some of these um, holes in the wood or, or inside stems. And some bees, um, like the leaf cutter bees, will uh, use leaves to separate out their um, different uh, eggs and the larva. Um, and you can see the little chambers that they make. So each of these little yellow things are, those are all larva developing. And others will use mud between the cells. And these are cocoons that are of developing uh, pupil uh, native bees. Others will nest in soil, in the ground. They do a similar kind of process of making these cells, but it's all underground. And down here on the bottom right, we see this is a bumblebee colony. So they live again in larger groups, but they often naturally live in the ground um, in, in these holes in the soil. So a ton of variety in terms of where they live, which we'll come back to this when we get into talking about how to help support native bees. So we'll, we'll come back to that topic. Um, but I do want to note that part of how they nest can make it really difficult to study native bees. Many of these bees are relatively rare in the environment, or they're active for very short periods of time, or they nest in places that are really difficult to locate or access without actually damaging the nest. Like it's hard to extract and assess a soil nesting bee without totally destroying that nest. So because of this, it makes it really difficult for researchers to get really good estimates on historic as well as current population numbers for a lot of specific native bee species. That doesn't mean that we don't have ways of doing it, but it's just harder, much harder to assess compared to honeybees where we have a lot of people that are paying attention to exactly what's going on with them and their numbers. So um, bees are incredibly important pollinators as I'm sure most of you are well aware. So nearly 90% of flowering plants are actually animal pollinated and bees make up the large majority of those insect pollinators. Um, other insect pollinators that do actually contribute a fair amount of pollination include beetles, flies, wasps, butterflies, moths, birds, and bats um, that can also be really uh, important for pollinating a lot of crops as well as native plants. And I know um, like most of you, we enjoy a lot of our fruits and vegetables and the idea of a life without bees is a little scary. So this picture here is showing on the left, our normal uh, produce section of our grocery store and on the right, what it might look like if we didn't have any bees. So uh, that's a little drab and a little scary because I think I would like to eat more than just oranges and some lettuce. Uh, so anyways, it's um, bees provide a really important uh, resource. Um, it's called an ecosystem service of pollination that we use to produce a lot of the crops throughout the world. So let's put some numbers on that just to, to give us a sense of how important these are. So this graph is, it's a little out of date, um, but it shows, nicely shows the role of honeybees as well as the role of other insects, which are primarily uh, native bees in the role of pollinating many different kinds of crops. So we can see that some crops like strawberries, peanuts, peaches, um, a lot of our fruits actually are pollinated quite well by these other insects. Um, honeybees are important pollinators for about one third of everything that we eat in the United States. So there's sort of a, a saying of every, one out of every three bites of food that you eat um, was pollinated by uh, honeybees in the United States. And globally, we see that over uh, 235 billion to 577 billion um, worth of dollars worth of global annual food production is relies directly on the contributions from pollinators. So that's huge. That's 
just an enormous amount of our food production relies on the existence of these, these important bees. And um, thinking back in the US, honeybees alone represent um, 1.2 to $5.4 billion worth of our agricultural productivity. So um, we really rely a lot on honeybees, but to make a stronger case for native bees and their role, they can be really important pollinators for certain kinds of crops or other native flowers. So uh, there's something called specialization. So some native bees are what's called a flower specialist. Um, and so that means they forage only on a specific um, native plant or crop type of plant. So it might be as, as narrow as a single species or a, a single genus of plants. Sometimes it's a, a family, but usually it's a pretty restricted group of plants that that bee will only forage on. And so that creates a really tight link between your plant species and your bee species. And uh, you really need both in order to survive. And we'll get back to that in a little bit. Um, but the consequences of that is that these bee species are then very effective pollinators for those plants. So one of my favorite examples of this is shown in the bottom right. Um, this is a squash bee here pollinating a squash plant. So you can see that this, um, this is a female here and she is absolutely covered in the squash pollen. And she is a really effective pollinator because she only visits other squash. So she's being, uh, doing a great job of moving poll squash pollen from one plant to another uh, with a very little um, dilution across of other types of pollen species from other plants. Um, and in fact, these bees have, their entire life cycle is tied to the squash plant. It's, it's a pretty cool example. Some other good examples with crops are bumblebees. So the Bombus impatiens here, pollinating a tomato flower as well as um, a blueberry flowers. They are quite good at pollinating these flowers compared to other species in part because they have something called buzz pollination, which allows them to vibrate their wings and uh, extract the pollen uh, in a really effectively and then move it to those same types of other flowers. However, I'm sure you've seen many of the news headlines that uh, honeybees in particular are not doing well, but many other native bees are not doing well either. They are declining. So in recent years, we've actually seen some in bee species be listed on the Endangered Species Act. So one is the rusty patch bumblebee shown on the top right here. So this is Bombus affinis. So it was once commonly distributed throughout the East and the Midwest of the United States, but it has declined from 87% of its historic range in recent years. And a little later, I will show you a map of that, what that looks like. But that's pretty dramatic. And it was actually listed on the Endangered Species Act list um, in March of 2017. Another one is these, uh, there were seven yellow-faced bees of the Hylaeus genus, which are native to Hawaii that were listed in September of 2017. And these bee species are native to the islands and they are specialist pollinators of the Naupaka flower, which is also only native and endemic to the Hawaiian islands. So again, going back to that tight link between those plants and their um, pollinators, if the pollinators are gone, that plant can't reproduce and that plant will also go extinct. So they, they tend to, we tend to see a, a tied relationship. So conserving both the pollinators as well as their plants uh, is really, really important. But broadly, we're seeing that native bees are not doing very well throughout much of the US. So this is a map of the United States showing wild bee or native bee abundance and um, you can see high abundance is shown in dark blue. So the areas that are dark blue means there's lots of bees there. And areas with low abundance are shown in yellow. So those are areas with very few bees usually. And you can see that there are vast portions of our country that fall into that yellow low abundance category. And those also happen to be the areas where we tend to have the most agriculture in our country. That's going to be a problem. So we need to make sure that we have 
uh, not only honeybees, but a lot of other native bees uh, in areas where we're producing most of our agriculture. Um, as I've mentioned earlier, it is difficult to study these native bees populations over such a vast area. Uh, and there's many details about the declines of specific bees that we don't understand very well because they're difficult to uh, study in, in large quantities. But we do have a lot of people that are doing great work trying to understand this. And there's some great citizen science projects, which I think there's been previous webinar webinars on um, that are trying to understand, um, detect these native bees throughout the country as much as possible and get a better handle on these numbers. Uh, we actually do have pretty good estimates for bumblebee populations and we're showing that those are also declining. So here's a quote from a 2015 paper where they said that the relative abundances of four bumblebee species have declined by up to 96% of, uh, and that their survey geographic ranges have contracted by 23 to 87%, some only within the last 20 years. So this graph is from that paper and you can see on the y-axis, we have the relative abundance. So that's the how many um, of those uh, individuals of the, each of those species that we're seeing. And across the, the x-axis, we have uh, five different bumblebee species. The black bars indicate the historic uh, relative abundance, and the light gray bars show the current relative abundance. You can see for two species, Bombus bimaculatus and Bombus impatiens, in the, the middle, they're actually doing better than they were historically. Whereas Bombus affinis, Bombus pennsylvanicus, and Bombus terrestris are uh, very difficult to find now. So we're seeing different trends for different species. So it's really important to understand that. Um, so we need to uh, make sure that we're, we're understanding the factors that are contributing to increases as well as declines in many of these species. Okay, so um, I know that there's been many other talks previously through the webinar where they've talked about declines in, in honeybees. Um, so I'm not gonna spend too much time talking about that today and I'm gonna focus primarily on the factors that contribute to native bee declines. However, uh, it's really important to note that most of them are actually the same. Uh, they, they're affected by the same kinds of factors. So. We'll be talking about pesticides, particularly the neonicotinoid pesticide class, habitat loss, climate change, and pathogens and parasites. There are, of course, many other factors that are contributing to both native bee and honeybee declines, uh, but these are the main ones that I'm going to focus on and some of the ones that are really the hard hitters in, in causing these declines. So first, pesticides. Um, the neonicotinoid pesticides are the ones that have been in the news a lot, and these are neuroactive um, uh, pesticides, so they affect neurotransmitters in the brain, and uh, being an insecticide, if bees are uh, hit directly with these, these pesticides, they cause mortality because bees are an insect. However, there's a lot of different ways that these bees can be exposed to pesticides that are not just being directly hit with them, but they can still cause what's called sublethal effects, even at relatively low doses. And some of the, the research has shown that these low doses can cause impairs in sociality for some species, poor navigation and memory, so they can't get back home or find their nests again. They reduce their foraging, so they're not as active, and they reduce their immune function and pathogen resistance. Uh, so you can see that there's going to be a lot of interactive effects in terms of how just even low doses of pesticides in the environment can have dramatic effects on these bees and their ability to just function normally. Uh, and I also want to make sure I note that fungicides and herbicides can also have negative impacts on bees. So many of these, these same sublethal effects, even though these, these types of um, pesticides are not uh, directly intended to harm insects, they do still, they're harmful chemicals in the environment and they can still cause a lot of these same issues for bees. So as I've noted earlier, pollinators 
really are tightly linked with their flower resources. So pollinators depend on the availability of flowers, especially if they're a specialist and they need a particular kind of flower. And then conversely, flowers depend on uh, pollinators um, for reproduction. So in, they need to be pollinated in order to produce seeds and allow them to reproduce and have any fitness. So um, these one cannot survive without the other. And this is especially critical for specialist bees that are tightly linked with a particular plant species. But as we see uh, greater changes with climate change, making sure that flower, flowers and their pollinators are overlapping in time is becoming increasingly difficult and can cause something that's called a mismatch in the timing of their uh, relationships. So for example, here in Michigan, we just had a, a spring snowstorm and a hard freeze last night. And many of you probably were quite worried about your uh, flowers and plants that are growing in your yard. The, you know, the things that emerge early with our warm spring and um, things like this, these kind of really variable temperature swings can wreak havoc on plants and pollinators alike. So if a plant or say a plant emerges early in the spring because it's so warm, but the pollinator is still hibernating, then you might see a mismatch in their timing where by the time the pollinator emerges and the plant has already been killed by an early freeze or a late freeze, um, that pollinator may not have its, its special plant available anymore and the plant didn't get pollinated before it was killed by the freeze. So um, this is an example that we're seeing play out again and again uh, throughout the country and um, can really lead uh, to these really important mismatches in the timing of these uh, specialist relationships. Another way that climate change is affecting pollinators is that it's causing range contractions and it's contributing to declines in bumblebees and likely other native bee species, but there's less um, clear studies on, on the other bee species. But this graph here shows the historic range in dark gray of Bombus affinis. That's the one that I mentioned that got listed on the Endangered Species Act. And its range has contracted both from the north and from the south to become a lot smaller. Um, so the light gray and the red dots are the areas where it's still found. Um, but it's, it's lost a ton of, of square footage of its uh, original range. So this is a big, big problem for a lot of bee species. Okay, so we're gonna move on to disease and parasites. So as um, beekeepers, I'm sure many people are aware of varroa mites. And one bit of really good news for native bees at least is that varroa mites don't infect native bees. They're specialized on honeybees alone. So we don't need to worry about the varroa mites for native bees. So that's a huge relief uh, because the varroa mites are one of the largest concerns for honeybees uh, and beekeepers. So yay. <laughs> Um, unfortunately, there are a lot of other parasites, including bacteria, viruses, protozoa, mites, and microsporidial fungi that do infect native bees. Um, and in fact, we're seeing that a lot of these parasites and pathogens infect honeybees as well as uh, native bees. And we're seeing a what's called spillover from honeybee populations into native bee populations. And um, a lot of these different parasites and pathogens have been really well studied in honeybees because we know a lot about honeybees and they're easier to study, but we don't know as much about the relative effects of a lot of these parasites in native bees in terms of whether they cause the same symptoms, are they as lethal, um, and how prevalent are they? We really don't know the answer to a lot of those questions. Um, so that is an important frontier where we're trying to understand um, how much spillover there is, how much these uh, different parasites and pathogens are 
contributing to the declines of native bees. But from what we do know, it seems like it, they are important. And I wanna focus in on, particularly on some viruses. So there are over 25 different viruses that are well known to infect, infect and cause mortality in honeybees. But more recent evidence has shown that a few of them, in particular, these three, black queen cell virus, deformed wing virus, and sac root virus are uh, spilling over from uh, honeybees into native bees. And um, similarly, we have limited understanding of how prevalent they are in native bees and what effects they have, but they are well known to um, cause mortality in honeybees. Um, all of these pictures are honeybees that are infected. And, um, and I'll talk a little bit more from my own research about uh, these, these three viruses and how they're showing up in native bees. So unfortunately, also these uh, viruses can be linked with Varroa. And as honeybee colonies have been moved around the world through trade and, and just um, yeah, the movement of these important resources of honeybees, um, we're seeing that both Varroa and deformed wing virus have also moved around the world. So this is a really big problem because that means that there's areas where native bees are present, different native bees are present in each of these different geographic regions that did not evolve to deal with these viruses and these other parasites and pathogens. So they are naive and they don't know, they don't have any defenses against them. So that can be really problematic and lead to large scale declines in some of those native bees that are um, being exposed by this movement. So it's definitely something to be uh, watchful for in the future. So we've talked about the use of pesticides. We've talked about loss of habitat and the importance of those links of, of, with plants. We've talked about climate change. Um, we talked about parasites and pathogens. And um, one thing I really want to strike home is that, so all of these factors are causing negative impacts on native bee populations, but these factors also interact with each other. So for example, um, both pesticides as well as the loss of good habitat resources can lead to reduced immune function in bees and leave them more susceptible to parasites. Um, and often then having higher parasite loads, which allows them to then transmit those parasites uh, more effectively. So sometimes these interactions can then compound those negative effects of each individual factor alone. And um, this is sort of the, the state of the field where we're trying to understand how do these interactions um, work and what species are really being impacted by, by these things. But um, I, it's not all doom and gloom. So I wanna leave you on a few better notes for the conservation of nat native bees. And I'm going to take a few moments to uh, share some of the work that I did as a part of my dissertation and the promising results for both honeybees as well as native bees um, in, that have been infected with those three viruses that I mentioned before black queen cell virus, deformed wing virus, and sac root virus. Okay, so in my study, I looked at the prevalence of those three viruses. Um, so prevalence is just the proportion of bees that are infected. And I looked at honeybees as well as three other common native bees that are found here in Michigan. And I found that honeybees had the highest virus prevalence for all three of the viruses followed by native bees, uh, which had more intermediate uh, virus prevalence, and sweat bees and squash bees, which are both native bees, um, were the least likely to be infected. So overall, these results were really exciting because they show that these three viruses um, are shared among these multiple species, but that native bees tend to be less infected than honeybees. So that was very cool. Um, and what I hope to find, but I wasn't sure whether that was what I would find 
However, I noticed that the viral prevalence varied among the different sites that I was working at. So I wanted to try to understand how does the pathogen prevalence um, vary among the different pollinator communities that I was working in. So although I looked at a number of different aspects of the pollinator community, I consistently found that the number of species or the species richness was the most important factor um, impacting viral prevalence in both honeybees and native bees. So Grant, in this graph, I'm showing virus prevalence on the y-axis, and um, I have species richness from 10 to 50 um, number of different native uh, number of different species bee species that I found in these communities. Um, and you can see there's the x-axis is repeated three times because I'm going to show a separate graph for each of the three viruses. So we'll we'll walk through it. And then the different colors and the lines you're going to see are matched by the outlines of each of those bee pictures on the far right. So for black queen cell virus, I saw that honeybees had the highest virus prevalence, but as you increase in the number of species found at each site, there is a decline in the black queen cell virus prevalence. And I saw the same result for um, the bumblebees and actually the sweat bees and the squash bees showed the same result as well, but it, they had much lower prevalence, so it's a harder to see that negative decline um, because it is already relatively low to begin with. For deformed wing virus, um, again, we see the same pattern, that nice decline as you increase in the number of species, um, there's less and less deformed wing virus found at those sites. So um, a really clear reduction in viral prevalence. And then finally, saccharide virus um, shows a similar pattern except that um, bumblebees tended to have higher saccharide virus prevalence than honeybees, but they both decline as you increase in the number of species in the community. And um, the squash bee and the sweat bee had very, very low saccharide viruses, incredibly rare. So they were effectively not infected with the, that. So we didn't see much of a change for them. So overall, these results are really good news for bee health and conservation. So it suggests that there's a win-win for conservation. And um, so if we promote diverse bee communities, we might be able to simultaneously reduce infections in managed bee colonies and as well as help maintain native bee diversity. So it's possible that honeybee colonies that um, may have a lower chance of getting viral infections in areas with lots of native bees. And uh, it might be a good idea to try to promote native bees in areas where honeybees are foraging and active in the in the, um, uh, actively managed. Um, and that way that might help promote native bees as well as reduce um, chances of infection for both honeybees and the native bees there. So um, again, to leave on a few higher notes, um, I'm gonna briefly talk about some things that can be done to preserve uh, pollinator communities, but um, I'm not gonna go into too much depth because as um, Anna noted, there's a talk by Dr. Rebecca Tanyato, which will be focusing on Michigan native bees and their ways to support them. So I'm sure she will go into a lot more detail of what you can do but I'll give you a few notes of um, things that can be done to help native bees uh, individually. So uh, first and foremost, increasing the foraging and nesting habitat for pollinators. So this can be done in pollinator gardens in your own yard, as well as having wildflower patches near farms. It's important to aim to have a continuous bloom from spring until fall. Many native bee species have really variable um, lengths of time that they're active, um, but it spans from uh, early spring. So now, like I've seen bees for about a month now, all the way through late fall. And uh, so making sure that you have a nice succession of uh, flowering plants for those bee species to uh, forage on is really useful. And then leaving dead branches, logs, and bare ground as nesting sites for bees is really helpful. There's a spot in my garden that has just a little bit of really soft soil and dirt 
And, you know, I'd love to be able to put something there, but I've noticed that every year there's some really early spring bees that nest in the ground there. And so um, if you try to turn up that soil, you'll end up destroying those nests. So I often try to leave that for them. Um, and yeah, leaving, you know, if you have a pollinator garden in your yard, leaving it be the stems of those plants can actually be really good places for those bees to hibernate as well as to nest in um, during the year. And then another really important thing to note is that if you're planting native flowers in your garden or in a native flower pot patch, make sure you're planting flowers that are native to the region that you live in. So the Xerces Society has a ton of really great resources as well as the MSU um, Pollinator Initiative website um, and a few others that I'll link in a few slides. And um, this is really important because sometimes the, like the general pollinator mixes that you'll see have species of plants that are not native to the entire United States. So for example, I've seen some of those mixes sold in Michigan that have California poppies uh, seeds in those mixes, which are not native here at all. So um, that's a really, unfortunately, a good way to spread uh, invasive species uh, or introduce species that shouldn't be here. So just do, do your research and, and find some, some good uh, native plant resources. And as I mentioned, check out Dr. Rebecca Tanyoto's talk in June, um, June 17th. Um, and another couple of things that you can do is reduce pesticide use as much as possible. Um, there's a, uh, a process called integrated pest management, which is basically an idea of only spraying when you really have to. And there's some really um, useful techniques for being able to manage pests in a, a really ecologically um, relevant way that also helps protect bees. And um, some of the resources I'm going to link to have little webinars or modules that you can do to get training on how to do that. If you really have to spray a pesticide, try to spray um, at night so that you're not directly spraying the bees themselves. Um, you can inform and inspire other people to help pollinators. So there's a National Pollinator Week uh, which is June uh, 21st to 27th this year. And there's also the US National Native Bee Monitoring Citizen Science Project, which you can get in touch with. Um, Dr. Rufus Isaacs is one of the contacts that's uh, local to MSU and um, our area. So that's a really great way to get involved as well. And then finally, supporting the work of groups that produce and promote science-based and practical efforts for pollinators just like this one. Um, this is a really great resource here at the MSU um, Pollinator Initiative, as well as uh, donating to groups like the Honeybee Health Grant. So this is actually a grant that gave me some of the seed money to do the project that I talked about a little bit earlier. So they, they help support young graduate students um, and early career scientists uh, to help them do really great honeybee work as well as for native bees. Okay, here are some of the links that I mentioned. Um, this whole talk is being recorded, so you can access those links later when the recording gets posted as well. Okay, um, with that, I am happy to take any questions. Uh, sorry if I ran a little bit long. Um, and I believe you can type your questions into the Q&A section and Anna will read it off to the group um, and I will answer to the best of my ability. I've really enjoyed getting to talk about native bees with all of you, and I hope that you guys all learned something and enjoyed the talk. I put my contact information in the bottom right there in case you'd like to get in touch with me or would like to see the full science article um, about the research that I mentioned. Um, so anyways, thank you very much. <laughs>